people are starting to move back into the physical spaces with the, with the uplifting of MCO. Uh, but I, I, I believe, you know, um, it's, webinars are always a great way for us to gain insights from experts who are in other parts of the world. Uh, so today today with us, you know, we have uh, Ivo uh, all the way from Amsterdam, right, Ivo? Uh, to, to share, to Geneva. share his insights. Yeah. Sorry? Geneva, Switzerland. Uh, Geneva, sorry, in, in, uh, in, in, uh, from, from Geneva to, to uh, share insights. So I'm Faros, uh, the ED for Global Compact Network Malaysia. Uh, thank you again uh, for joining here. Now, just let me uh, uh, do a little bit of context setting and also introduce Evo properly to all our audiences today. Uh, welcome to our webinar uh, for, for this month uh, on how climate finance can be at the heart of economic growth post-COVID-19. Now, the COVID pandemic is uh, rewriting uh, how we operate at individual, corporate and society levels. Now, some see this as an opportunity to reset how things need to be done, whilst others see this as bread and butter issues as the only material matter uh, in the short and mid terms. Now, just earlier in the year, uh, the World Economic Forum Risk Report for the first time had indicated social and environmental risk as, most, as more likely and more impactful than economic risk. Now, fast forward today, in a new research by WEF, the collective views of a cross-section of risk professionals highlights economic risk as a three, as a top three, with environmental risk now demoted to a top 20 standing. Now, is this the situation of the new normal, where concerns for economic well-being will eclipse environmental and social factors? Or is this just a healing crisis before we come together to realize that a sustainable future cannot be achieved if we continue to decouple ESG factors? Now, to give more insights uh, into this, uh, we are very honored to have um, Ivo, uh, Ivo Mulder, uh, Ivo Mulder is the head of the clim uh, climate unit at UNEP, uh, and he has initiated a number of innovative projects that develop business cases for the private and finance sector to tackle environmental challenges. Uh, he co-founded and directed the Natural Capital Declaration, now rebranded as the Natural Capital Finance Alliance. He co-initiated the Red Plus work at UNEP Finance Initiative in 2011. At present, he is focusing on developing a number of novel private finance facilities that aim to unlock at the direct and private finance towards zero deforestation, agriculture, and rest rest restoration of degraded land. He has over 12 years of professional experience working for U UNEP, private consulting firms, and with NGOs. Ivo is a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts and member of the Dutch Association of Sustainable Investors. During his free time, he pursues a variety of outdoor sports such as triathlons, diving, and mountain hiking. Now, uh, before I officially handing over to Ivo some house rules, um, we have a chat function in our Menti page. If you go to www.menti.com, type in the code 345727, you will see this uh, question uh, page. You can type in your questions, and in the questions, you can also up upvote your questions. So the most popular questions will definitely will ask that uh, in the Q&A session. Um, uh, at the end, of five minutes before we end, we'll also will run a mentee poll with everyone. Uh, we, will, we, will, we will walk you through how to do that in, in, in a while. So with that, uh, Ivo, the floor is yours. Great. Thanks a lot, uh, Faroz. Just double checking if, you, if everyone can hear me. Yes. Perfect. And you can also see my screen. Yes. Okay. Well, I'm very grateful uh, to the UN Global Compact uh, for um, inviting me to, to present to you all. Um, I'm based in Geneva, Switzerland. Uh, I work for the UN Environment Program, which uh, basically is the environmental authority within, uh, within the UN system. Um, within UNEP, I focus primarily on how do we create incentives for businesses and finance to switch towards a low carbon sustainable economy. Um, I think there's still a persistent belief that um, what is good for the environment is bad for business. And I think we really need to break away from that thinking. Um, but that is only possible if uh, people on this call and in many other meetings are seeing practical examples of how investments in renewable energy or energy efficiency or sustainable agriculture can both deliver investment returns but also be good for, uh, from a societal perspective, uh, giving fair wages to people and, and obviously addressing environmental challenges. Um, Faroz kindly asked me to focus on the link between climate finance um, and, and the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, because at the moment, a lot of governments around the world 
are basically putting uh, stimulus packages in place to um, help preserve jobs, um, stimulate uh, different sectors across the economy. Um, but as a result of it, many more governments will be, uh, the debt levels of, of many governments will, will rise further. Uh, and also private finance will be squeezed. So how these uh, public stimulus packages are being uh, shaped will to a large extent determine, in my view, the degree to which we can meet the uh, objectives under the Paris Climate Agreement or other international uh, objectives. I think Faroz has already highlighted the, the, house, the housekeeping rules. Uh, from my perspective, I, given that this is a, a virtual webinar, I would have loved to be in, in KL myself. Um, from my perspective, let's make it as interactive as possible. I'm both happy to answer questions, clarifying questions during the presentation, and hopefully there will be enough opportunity um, also after this presentation for the remaining time. So I would like to start uh, with this slide, which has been put together by an organization called Vivid Economics. What they've basically looked at is um, the link between uh, public stimulus packages uh, to address the COVID pandemic and the degree to which these um, negatively or positively influence um, the climate crisis, uh, the, the, the biodiversity crisis, etc. Um, what is important to, to realize is, is that the total amount of money that governments around the world have, have made available to date over the past months equals about uh, 10 bill, sorry, $10 trillion, so $10,000 billion. It's, it's a staggering amount. Um, of that, at the moment at least, um, at least a third is projected to go to what, at least from a UNEP perspective, we would term the brown economy, oil and gas, uh, airlines, etc., without any uh, incentives to try and switch to different business models. And this is what I mentioned before. Um, we are fully in favor of helping businesses and, and preserving jobs. But from our perspective, it is important to provide incentives to move towards, say, low emission aircraft, uh, to move towards different business practices across sectors that have a less negative impact on the climate and, and the environment. Um, some notable exceptions, uh, the European Commission has put forward. Sorry, sorry Ivo, could you just make your slides in the presentation mode for making it a bit bigger? Yeah. All right, let me see. Is this better? Yes, better. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Thanks for that. Um, so, some notable exceptions. The European Commission has um, released what they call the, the European Green Deal. Um, basically, what they are going to do is work with the EU 20, 27 member countries to make sure that any public stimulus that goes towards businesses and that goes towards job preservation is in line with international agreements related to climate change, related to sustainable development goals, etc. Uh, other exceptions are France, United Kingdom, uh, Canada as well. But many other countries, as you see here, um, are not putting any kind of incentives in place to switch towards a low carbon uh, economy. Again, from my perspective, but it would be good to, to hear your views and see if you agree or disagree with me. Um, the, big, the big issue is that governments who are already very much in debt, who will be issuing more debt, uh, will have uh, fiscal constraints to deal with the environmental crises uh, post-COVID. Um, so if this terrible crisis uh, from a human health perspective and an economic perspective is not used as a force for good and as a force for change, my fear is that there will be less leeway for governments to address the increasingly costly environmental crises that we're finding ourselves in. So um, the UN Global Compact uh, Malaysia chapters asked me uh, to focus uh, specifically on the, uh, the link between climate finance and what is called the EU taxonomy, which I will explain um, shortly what this is about. Uh, it will have a far reaching effect on how finance investments will be shaped in the years to come. Uh, some best practices from a policy, private sector and investment perspective, and then some opportunities uh, in this new normal that Feroz uh, started the, the, the webinar uh, with. And then hopefully we'll have enough time for questions as well, and please feel free to put them in the chat box. 
So first of all, um, I think it is important to, uh, for those who are not aware of it, is to highlight the urgency of the environmental challenges that we're finding ourselves in. Um, we're basically on track um, to a world that will be free 0.4 to 4 degrees warmer than it was in the pre-industrial uh, age. This sounds like a, a small uh, amount of warming, but it will lead to the collapse of uh, coral reefs. It will lead to the thawing of the permafrost in, uh, in Siberia. It will lead to all kinds of tipping points that will increasingly have a negative economic and financial cost as well as health impacts. So for those who do not believe that there is a link between uh, environmental sustainability and, and the economy, that is just not true anymore. Um, what you see on the right hand side, uh, anything that is in the gray or red bar, uh, we've already basically passed the threshold of what we can consider a safe operating space for humanity. Uh, from the loss of, uh, of, of genetic diversity to climate change, to the nitrogen and phosphorus cycle, uh, and to land use systems change, including deforestation. To put it um, in, in, a, in a summary, looking at uh, the climate, biodiversity, and land degradation, um, the projected cost um, from unaddressing the climate crisis in the years to come is, is scheduled to be in the order of magnitude of, of more than $200 billion a year, um, both in terms of physical losses that uh, we'll experience indirect costs such as weaker economic growth and lower asset value for companies and uncertainty. And if there's one thing that investors do not like, it's, it's uncertainty. Um, let me see. The second one, um, we're basically losing species at a rate that is uh, dozens to 100 times higher than it used to be in the pre-industrial uh, age. Um, at the moment, uh, the expectation is that in the decades to come, a million species um, will become extinct uh, if we're not addressing ecosystem degradation. And previously, uh, financiers and investors told me, well, this is a big environmental issue, but it's not a financial issue. Um, and this is the reason why I created the Natural Capital Finance Alliance, to make the link between how ecosystem degradation is impacting the, the real economy, but also the financial sector. The Dutch Central Bank came up with a report last week that basically says that one third of all the assets of the Dutch financial system, which is $1.4 trillion, is at risk from biodiversity loss. So that's a staggering amount of $510 billion um, that um, could be written off if we are failing to, un to address biodiversity um, and ecosystem degradation. And lastly, from a land degradation perspective, uh, there's already a staggering amount of 2 billion hectares of degraded land, uh, which is leading to an annual cost of $230 billion a year, and with a potential further economic cost up to 2050 of $23 trillion. So our economy so far is based on extracting resources and externalizing the environmental cost to society, um, which is for governments to address. Increasingly, um, we see that those externalized costs will impact businesses uh, on their P&L, their profit and loss account, either for higher costs or lower revenues. Uh, and this will hit the banking and investment sector through um, write-offs of non-performing loans or lower investment returns on certain types of listed and unlisted equities. So that is the link between the environment, the real economy, and the financial sector. So one, I would say a very <laughs> unsexy topic uh, is called the, 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 the EU taxonomy on sustainable finance. Basically, um, what the financial sector has done over the past years, and I'm sure um, it has le received some attention also in Malaysia, is what is green and what is sustainable. Many banks have, have issued uh, green bonds. Um, many companies are claiming um, to have uh, sustainability related expenditure or, or revenue, but there isn't really, there isn't really a, a, um, a standard that basically says what is sustainable and what is not sustainable. What the European Commission has done over a period of more than two years uh, involving many experts 
uh, from across the European uh, Union is to say for the agricultural sector, for oil and gas, for forestry, for manufacturing, for tourism and many other sectors, what activities are considered sustainable because they address climate change, because they address biodiversity loss or other uh, environmental uh, issues and which ones do not. What is also important uh, up front to note is that the European Parliament has passed uh, the EU taxonomy as a law and it will become a law from 2022 for every financial institution to mandatorily disclose the amount of assets that are uh, considered to be sustainable and which ones are considered to be conventional or unsustainable. And the belief is that through this mandatory disclosure, there will be a wave that uh, will increasingly also move towards emerging markets um, where these standards will become adopted. What are the objectives under the EU taxonomy? It's to address, first of all, climate mitigation and climate adaptation, sustainable protection of water and marine uh, resources, move to a circular economy, so that's reuse uh, of, of the resources, pollution prevention and control, and protection and restoration of biodiversity and ecosystems. Um, what does it try to do? So what is it asking uh, from every company and bank and invest investment firm in the European uh, Union is to at least contribute one of the six environmental objectives that are listed here, while at the same time making sure there's no negative impact or trade-off on any of the other five, with minimum safeguards to comply with. So again, as I said, this will become a law in the EU, but um, what is crucially uh, important is that if you have a European-based bank, for example, that is doing business in, in Malaysia, it will have to report its um, sustainable or unsustainable assets both in the EU but also outside the EU. So investments in palm oil or rubber or manuf uh, car manufacturing, for example, uh, those will have to be visualized on the balance sheet of European-based uh, legal entities. So ultimately, given that we live in a globalized economy, um, the standard is expected to have uh, repercussions beyond the European Union. What are some of the proposed criteria for different sectors? So for transport, you talk about zero tailpipe and very low emissions. Uh, agriculture is, is maintaining uh, carbon in the soil, uh, improving carbon capture um, through forest restoration, for example, and climate smart agriculture. Um, that's, for different sectors, there are different requirements. You can see them uh, here. They're also available online. Um, but they've basically identified for each sector in the economy uh, and, there's, and the subsectors, I think there's 167 uh, subsectors in total, what is considered uh, to be uh, a sustainable activity uh, and, and would therefore have to be reported on from the year 2022, which is only 18 months away from now. The same for electricity, buildings and forestry. So for forestry, which I focus on a lot, for example, it's about maintaining and improving carbon. Uh, if you talk about uh, buildings and infrastructure, uh, it's, it's about uh, supply chain and small or medium sized enterprises and, and the degree to which improvements are made in terms of energy efficiency, for example. So that's the first topic, um, basically an introduction to um, the EU taxonomy and how this makes a link to, to climate finance. Um, what are some best practices? Um, so these are the, the, the targets that the EU has set under the Green Deal. is a minimum reduction of 50 to 55 percent of emissions compared to 1990. Um, improve the share of renewable energy in final energy consumption up to 32 percent. Um, and um, achieve energy savings compared to business usual of 32 percent. So the way how the European Commission frames it and the way how this could be framed in every other uh, country is to say yes investments are necessary to make this transition but ultimately this is an opportunity for uh, for businesses and financiers to um, to invest in a, in a low carbon uh, and more resilient uh, economy. Um, you can call it an investment gap of 175 to 290 billion. You could also call it an opportunity to meet that gap, basically. And coming back to my, my uh, 
my initial slide, how this links to, to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and, and the stimulus packages. If governments in, from Malaysia to India and Russia to, to, to France were to put those stimulus packages in place to incentivize businesses to invest in energy efficiency, uh, renewable energy or sustainable agriculture, then it will be more, it will be easier um, to see a silver lining in this, uh, in this terrible dark days, basically. Um, and that's, that's why I think the link between COVID-19, climate finance, and moving towards a sustainable economy is so important. If you look at it from a private sector perspective, I think there's many um, um, pieces of information out there. I've, I've just used one, uh, which was produced by uh, SUSO and uh, Corporate Knights, which have put together uh, the Carbon Clean 200. So they've basically looked at which businesses have targets in place to move towards um, um, objectives under the Paris Climate Agreement of becoming ultimately net zero by 2050. Um, they've basically uh, ranked 200 businesses that are uh, pioneers in this uh, field. Uh, I've listed just the top 10 here. Uh, what you see on the right hand side is the perf financial performance of these uh, businesses compared to the uh, S&P uh, Global 1200. So basically the 1200 biggest listed companies globally. Uh, and what you see on the purple line is that there's basically outperformance of those businesses that are basically delivering investment returns in terms of higher share prices and dividends for investors, um, but which are also uh, having climate targets that are quite um, pioneering, basically. So the idea again that what is good for the environment is bad for business just doesn't, doesn't hold true. From an investor perspective, there are many um, initiatives also ongoing. Um, what I think is important to realize that um, th there will be a growing demand from investors to businesses in the real economy to demonstrate what activities they are taking or actions they're taking to provide fair wages uh, to uh, employees, um, to make sure that labor standards are respected, uh, but also to make sure that um, we're moving towards a, a low carbon economy. Um, one example that I've listed here, and I will share the slide deck with all of you afterwards, is uh, something called the Net Zero Asset Owner Alliance. So these are 26 large pension funds, insurance companies that have basically said, we are looking at every company that we invest in. And if these companies are not meeting the climate uh, targets, we will ultimately um, disengage from these companies. So there will probably be a engagement process initially, but the ultimate objective is to have an investment portfolio that is what they can call uh, Paris aligned. In other words, uh, aligned with a reduction of uh, emissions by 50% up to 2030 and net zero by 2050. So this will ultimately have impact on the investment portfolios that these very large uh, institutional investors are managing. Um, there's other initiatives as well. There's a big push now uh, from some com uh, countries for setting science-based targets. So basically looking at what science tells us in terms of what emission reductions are necessary, what um, biodiversity protection is necessary, and basically putting business and finance targets as a result of it. There's the Climate Action 100, well, there's, there's many others. UNEP uh, Finance Initiative last year launched the Principles for Responsible Banking uh, at the UN Climate Summit. They already have 180 banks who've signed up it, uh, to it at CEO level. The target for this year or the objective for this year is for any of these banks is to set targets. So how are you engaging with clients across your portfolios to make sure that they are moving towards a, uh, a responsible based uh, banking business? Um, there's many others like the principles for responsible investment, uh, institutional investor group on climate change. Um, apologies for the spelling mistakes, by the way. Um, that uh, will increasingly drive um, how they are, um, which clients they're banking uh, and, and, and which uh, investee companies they're investing in. So again, those businesses that are well prepared because they can, they can 
outline what they're doing compared to their peers or their second, their sector peers will probably be um, more appealing uh, for those investors and banks that have set targets. What are some opportunities in this new normal? Uh, as Faroz was starting this uh, conversation, um, we will likely stay in this, this, um, this pandemic until um, uh, a vaccine is found. Uh, and even after that, it will take some time to move towards a, a level of economic activity that was comparable to, to what it was uh, pre-COVID. Um, so how can banks and then financiers uh, push for sustainability post-COVID? Um, I would say is for companies that are linked, for example, to the UN Global Compact uh, Malaysia, is to engage with both your local and especially federal government is to see what incentives that the Malaysian government or what incentives could the Malaysian government put in place uh, to make sure that um, there are incentives being being placed to move towards uh, a low carbon uh, sustainable and resilient economy for Malaysia. Um, that could mean uh, fiscal or trade policies to stimulate sustainable production, processing and trade of goods. It could mean uh, providing guarantees or soft loans to make a switch towards investing in um, low emission housing or infrastructure um, or deforestation free uh, commodity production. The second um, recommendation or the second option um, is, is for Malaysian based businesses also to set targets in relation to the UN Sustainable Development Goals uh, or the Paris Climate Agreement is to calculate your own emission footprint of your own business but also mapping what kind of suppliers or client are you buying goods from or providing services to. Um, and to set emission targets, for example, by the year 2030, but also 2050. And last but not least is to then to assess, um, um, depending on the type of business, uh, uh, what impacts you're having on biodiversity, forest uh, and land, and, and see what kind of um, means can be put in place to reduce the impact by 2030 and 2050. The last uh, recommendation is, is a plea to, to try and innovate and pioneer. Um, I think there is a, a feeling by some companies is to try to go back to business usual as soon as possible after the COVID pandemic uh, is over with. Uh, and obviously, I think short-term liquidity is, is the most important uh, topic on mind for most managers and, and senior business leaders is how does my business survive? Um, that is and should be obviously at the heart of, of what you're doing. Um, but this, again, terrible moment in history is perhaps also providing an opportunity to see what kind of innovation and pioneering can you put in place for your respective business to make uh, a change that you may have wanted to do but have been holding back on um, for, for, the, for the past years. So from UNEP side, uh, as Faroz uh, started the introduction uh, of me, um, I've been trying to say like, what kind of changes can we make, uh, can we incentivize for banks and investors to invest in say sustainable agriculture and sustainable forestry? I think we see a lot of uh, momentum with regards to renewable energy and energy efficiency. And in many, uh, in many countries, this is now an established as a class. When you talk about forestry and agriculture, um, this is really not the case. There's very little capital that is directed that does not have a negative impact on the climate and it does not have a negative impact on um, nature. Um, we've partnered with Rabobank. We've created a $1 billion uh, partnership um, with the objective to issue up to a billion dollars in loans by Rabobank and other uh, banks that have specific um, targets around uh, improving rural livelihoods um, for smallholder farmers, for example, um, to stop deforestation and to improve agricultural practices. What the bank in this case said is we cannot pay for this transition ourselves. Um, so we've basically engaged with the Dutch government and with other governments to put in place um, um, what we call a de-risking capital in the form of guarantees and soft loans 
to basically pay part of the, the cost that is related to a, a longer term loan uh, with a tenor that is not say five years, but seven or 10 years. Um, and which also covers the, the excess risk of dealing with smallholder farmers, for example. That is the agri-free fund uh, for which we've raised 93 million uh, so far um, and which is, is operational as of last month. I'll shortly highlight an example in Indonesia um, with a, a rubber plantation. Another example is the End Green Fund. Uh, they've raised about $127 million from Unilever, from Norway, and the Global Environment Facility through UNEP. Um, and again, this is a fund that is available for any business that tries to marry or tries to combine um, investment returns from agriculture or investment returns from forestry, but to couple that with targets around um, forest protection and, and, and reforestation. This is a bond that we've helped um, create with BNP Paribas, the a French-based uh, finance institution with Michelin uh, acting as the, um, the off-taker uh, to buy rubber at a pre-agreed price for the coming 15 years. And where the plantation itself sits in, um, in Jambi, um, in, in, in Sumatra, um, in, in Indonesia, and where Basically, the U.S. government provided a guarantee um, to lower the risk of this transaction, which enabled uh, a range of investors to basically buy this bond. Um, and I would like to show a video as a result of it, if I can. Uh, so let me see if I can do that. Um, I hope you could see the screen shortly. The future of the environment and businesses are closely interlinked. Climate change now poses the biggest and most likely threat to the global economy over the next decade. Market and reputational risk, as well as regulatory pressure on companies linked to unsustainable soft commodity production, means current business practices need to change with many already exposed to potential stranded assets. So how do we redirect private capital to avoid forest and biodiversity loss, improve the well-being of local communities, and ensure the agricultural sector thrives through profitable business models? Combining the capabilities of banks, governments, and agribusinesses through blended finance instruments is key to transforming the way we finance sustainable land use. The world's first landscapes bond, issued by the Tropical Landscapes Finance Facility and developed by BNP Paribas and ADM Capital, is financing a sustainable natural rubber plantation on degraded land in Indonesia. In the inaugural transaction, a 95 million US dollar bond was issued to capital market investors through structured notes of varying tenors and rank. This successful deal helped an Indonesian natural rubber producer scale up production and yield while setting aside part of the concessions for forest restoration, ecosystem conservation, and community programs with jobs provided to local workers for farming the rubber plantations. An offtake agreement was also negotiated, guaranteeing the sale of the majority of rubber grown. In such a pioneering deal, some form of risk mitigation is required. This is where public finance was crucial, with a partial credit guarantee offering security to some bondholders in case of default, helping broaden the investor base and lowering the overall funding cost of the transaction. The success of this project will increase the appetite of other banks, investors, and agribusinesses to finance projects that combine financial performance with clear environmental and social benefits. We cannot achieve sustainable development, we can't finance it. And for this, we have to bring both the public and the private sector on board. There is a need for urgent action and mobilization of private sector capital. What makes us unique is that we have the access to a farmer, 
the UN environment gives us the possibility to provide extra incentives for the farmer to change his behavior day to day. These and other successful blueprints can then be replicated across the agricultural and financial sectors, reducing the levels of public finance required and turning sustainable agriculture into an investable business proposition. So, as Faroz knows, the UN is very good at, at convening. In this case, we've uh, tried to create some, as I would call, proof of concept uh, deals. Um, obviously, this is more the exception than the norm at the moment. Um, but there is no limitation for uh, Malaysian banks, investment firms, uh, and businesses to try and replicate this, basically. So this is the final message that uh, I would like to sort of close my presentation with is, is, is to think outside the box of, of what is it that you can do that still makes business and finance sense, um, but is moving towards this, this, this low carbon sustainable economy that we need to move towards. Um, if you look at the UN Global Compact uh, Leaders Summit that took place uh, recently, this notion of science-based targets was also mentioned there. So the challenge, of course, for every individual business is how do you move towards those science-based targets while uh, looking at your P&L, while looking at your balance sheet and uh, making long-term business sense. So in this case, if there's support needed from international organizations or from, say, the Malaysian government, then I think this is the right time for, during this pandemic uh, to have these kinds of conversations. So with that, um, I would like to close my, my presentation. Thanks. Thank you, thank you, Ivo, for that uh, insightful uh, presentation. Uh, I already see some questions being asked. However, uh, as Ivo uh, requested earlier, we, we also want to make this as interactive as possible. So if any of the uh, uh, participants would like to ask a question directly, please raise your hands uh, and then we'll give you a chance to, to uh, ask the questions to Ivo. But uh, Ivo, if I can just get the ball rolling. Uh, uh, before that, I just, I'm happy to share uh, that last week we had one of our key members, uh, Sarawak Energy, uh, to, to sign up to our uh, the, the business leaders uh, pledge for 1.5 degrees and being the first Malaysian com company to publicly commit towards uh, SBTIs. Uh, so that, that's a great uh, story for us in Malaysia and we hope more and more private sector in Malaysia will also embark on this journey. Uh, we are still on the lookout for the first Malaysian company to commit to carbon net zero and God willing will come soon. Um, uh, and, and in that, um, I'd I like to pick up a question by uh, Irwan, uh, who is coincidentally from Sarawak Energy, um, his, his question, you know, can you share the acceptance of the TCFD uh, approach in, for European corporations for carbon disclosure? Sorry, I didn't get the question. Can I, can I share? What, what's the acceptance of TCFD as a framework for European corporations as part of their carbon disclosure? Because earlier you, you shared many different initiatives, but what, what, do you, what is your thoughts on TCFD? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the the I think what really helped the TCFD process is the fact that it was led by the financial industry. So, um, Mark Carney and Michael Bloomberg were um, the the leaders of of uh, of this initiative, but it was developed with a lot of engagement of and by and by uh, banks and investors. And as a result of it, there is a lot of acceptance, at least from European-based uh, banks and investors even though in practice they are also struggling to try and implement it. Um, I think there is uh, less and less um, reluctance uh, to try and, uh, and, and make this happen. Um, but I think many of them would probably um, acknowledge in private that it is a, a technical challenge uh, and that it ultimately also will affect the business because you need to discuss with clients who are uh, not uh, in compliance with it to see how to move forward with it. And very few banks and investors want to basically um, uh, disengage from clients because that's bad for business. So I think that is, a, that is going to be a, uh, a challenge uh, for, the, for the months and year to come. Right. And, and, and a following up, following up question to that, I know as the TCFD is, is very much based on various scenario planning approaches and how companies are uh, no, re-looking re at their, uh, their uh, strategies for, in terms of climate mitigation adaptation. Uh, in your opinion, do you believe that uh, companies that already are in the process of changing their structures and strategies to manage climate change would 
able to uh, adopt or outperform the market during such uh, issues like COVID? Yeah, absolutely. So I think uh, if you've seen uh, the slide that, uh, that I've uh, provided about the, the clean 200, you see that uh, they're already financially outperforming the S&P 1200. In other words, um, many businesses that have set targets on, um, on objective and, and absolute uh, carbon emission reductions um, are financially outperforming their peers who haven't done that, basically. So yes, it is possible. Um, it obviously does require a lot of um, um, innovation and thinking by those businesses to make that happen. But if, if you look at what Unilever, for example, did, they, they've set a target of halving uh, environmental impact and doubling sales or revenue, basically. They framed it from an environmental perspective, but it is basically an economic or financial perspective. Um, if you reduce um, energy, for example, or if you reduce water, that is basically a cost saving for the, for the business uh, that ultimately positively impacts the P&L of the business. So if you think from a perspective of where can I save, where can I become more efficient, uh, how, which suppliers should I deal with, uh, what requirements should I ask, then I think it is possible to already make a lot of um, um, low hanging fruit positive changes um, that are both good for business and for the environment. And my belief is also that in the years to come, there could be preferential interest rates um, for those businesses that are demonstrating uh, positive impact for say people and the planet. Right. Um, thank you for that. So I, uh, I also like to take this opportunity to uh, uh, invite uh, some questions from the floor. Uh, maybe uh, we can invite uh, Datin Sri Sunita to uh, kick off uh, with her question. Thank you. Ivo, thank you so much for this presentation. Very useful. I wanted to ask you a question. Should we be working towards decarbonizing? Because there's also a lot of uh, thinking that we need economic degrowth, that the planet simply cannot support both population growth and economic growth. And if we look at your Sumatran rubber Michelin deal uh, as an example, did it result in still net uh, 43,000 hectares of deforestation, even if uh, part of it was retained as forests? I wanted to hear your views on that. Um, yeah, I mean, there, there are a number of people inside UNEP and international organizations who believe we need to have a, a deep growth or zero growth uh, policy. Personally, I don't think this is possible. I mean, I've lived in Kenya myself, for example, and if you have poor farmers and you, you, or <laughs> um, bottom of the pyramid and you tell them that there should be no economic, net economic growth, that's just not possible. Uh, there will be more people on the planet. There's more mouths to feed. Um, so. I think what we need is sustainable economic growth. So economic growth that is not dependent on the continuous extraction of resources and externalization of the cost to society. Um, I think the, the mental barrier that we have to overcome is the belief that it is possible to create a circular economy, that it is possible to create a business model that is based on efficiency uh, and thereby good for business um, while also being good for the planet. Because if we don't do it, and we continue with this business as usual scenario, there will be more economic cost as a result of runaway climate change. There will be more costs as a result of continuous ecosystem degradation. The challenge, of course, and this is what you've highlighted in the, in the Indonesian uh, the rubber uh, example, is how to create a business model on the ground that works for a plantation company, but is also sufficiently of interest to investors who are very risk averse. So in this case, um, as you've probably seen indeed, um, is part of the rubber plantation is, is trying to increase the yields on both part of the plantation that is destined for rubber and, and to try to use those agricultural practices that maximize rubber production. While maintaining those areas on the plantation, which is quite large, it's about 70,000 hectares that still contains primary tropical forest and giving uh, an opportunity to uh, local communities who are living on that 70,000 hectares through, say, a smallholder rubber plantation. Uh, sorry, a rubber, um, it's basically a plasma scheme for, for, um, for uh, smallholder rubber uh, producers. 
the, the, the challenge, of course, is to make this interesting for the plantation company, ROU, uh, Royal Lestari Otuma, in this case, um, to make it interesting for the one who's buying the rubber, in this case, Michelin, and to make it interesting for, for the investor. In this case, what was needed was a, a, a guarantee by the US government to lower the cost of the transaction, um, to increase the, um, uh, the credit rating of the bond, to to basically provide some assurances to investors. And that is the, the challenge, is to, to really think out, out of the box of how to make this happen. The same could be applied, obviously, in an easier way to renewable energy, energy efficiency, uh, manufacturing, you name it. But I, personally, I don't believe a zero growth uh, economic model is, is, is possible, neither for developed nor for emerging markets. Thank you for uh, this. Um, just going back to your comment, you know that ESG uh, or any investors are very risk averse. Uh, the example given was Indonesia, which is a lower income uh, country, um, in, in which the, in which there are many, I would say, external donors uh, and so, and partners who are, who are able to come in to to provide various um, innovative financing schemes. Now, if you take Malaysia as example, we are a mid mid income country uh, where we we're, we're in a position where we are not poor enough to get aid, yet we are not rich enough to do many of these innovative processes. So in your opinion, how can a country like Malaysia also adopt such uh, innovative climate financing uh, approaches? Um, I mean, I don't know what, what the current uh, debt levels are of, of the Malaysian government, but assuming that they are um, at, at sustainable levels, um, it, it comes back exactly to, to what I mentioned in um, on the first slide, is any, um, public stimulus that Malaysian government provides to make sure that jobs are preserved in Malaysia and to make sure that the Malaysian economy is ultimately um, benefiting from, again, this terrible crisis. The, the types of incentives that are built in to make sure that um, those Malaysian businesses that are probably also UN Global Compact members, um, to basically provide a push to help you as businesses who are uh, online today, make that switch uh, and basically share the cost of the transition. That, that is basically what I would advise because as you said for those, the, 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 the international donors will prioritize uh, poor and lower middle income countries and they will say Malaysia is rich enough to do this. Um, I do think there is a opportunity for, for Malaysia to attract um, these blended finance models for uh, renewable energy and energy efficiency, um, as well as sustainable agriculture. I'm pretty sure Malaysia is not excluded from that. Um, so it, it's really to get outside this mindset of, of aid and really think about a business proposition where a government is providing uh, taxpayers money in the form of guarantees and soft loans to help pay for the transition towards um, more sustainable manufacturing, um, low emission housing, um, uh, energy efficient retrofitting of buildings, you name it. There's a lot of low hanging fruits and a lot of investments that, are, that can provide jobs for many people in Malaysia, uh, which are good again for business and for, and for the economy. I think you're muted, uh, Faros. Uh, th thanks for that, uh, Ivo. Do we have any other questions uh, from the floor? Anybody would like to share a question or maybe some comments? Okay, while, while we're waiting for that, Ivo, um, I, I have a question in terms of the EU taxonomy and, and uh, approach. Um, what would be, how, how, how do you foresee the reporting structure for the EU sustainable taxonomy? Uh, now how would uh, exporting nations and businesses like those based in Malaysia uh, report such data that is required? How, how do you see that happening? Um, the way how I see that happening is that any EU-based business that needs to comply with the law uh, will have to ask the data from their clients. So, um, say an export, um, say trade agreement uh, or shipping that's of credit to export a certain commodity that is moving to the European Union that is paid for by a European-based legal entity the client will have to report the data on, um, on what the bank or the investor will basically have to, to report, which is around uh, emissions, which is around, um, um, yeah, what I, what I mentioned. So basically there are a number of indicators. Um, so 
it will be a struggle for for i think the entities to ask that data from clients but that is something that will come in in the in the months to come um i don't know exactly what the data uh, will be but it is data around around those six objectives that i uh, highlighted in my presentation uh for those let me see where that is um Yeah, I don't see it at the moment. Um, oh yeah, this one here. Um, so it will be data around these six objectives, basically. So any any legal entity will have to report on this from 2022, and underneath any of these six objectives are a number of indicators. So that data will be asked by those entities to say clients in Malaysia, for example. And this is also why, even if it's an EU law, it will have global uh, repercussions because Malaysia does, does trade with Brazil and Brazil does trade with the EU and et cetera. So, so because um, you have this big powerful economic block basically setting a standard that is expected to be, uh, to have impact beyond the European Union basically. The, just out of curiosity, do you do you foresee European companies paying a bit more uh, for for this kind of uh, I would say extra uh, disclosures requirement? No, I don't think so. But um, I do believe that ultimately uh, sustainability requirements have to be built into the price of the product. So uh, it should not be uh, the the producer who has to pay for those costs. It should be the consumer who ultimately has to pay for it. So I think there needs to be a push to, to see what kind of economic incentives can be provided to consumers to increase the expenditure uh, with relates to, to sustainably produced commodities. So I could very well expect for us that the first um, uh, reporting in 2022 will reveal very low um, assets that are moving towards the say sustainable uh, assets that I mentioned. What will happen then, thereafter is the European Commission basically setting a target um, right. And that target can only be met if if either those costs are absorbed by the producers, which I don't think is fair, or you provide incentives to the consumers to increase the um, the expenditure of the sustainably produced commodities. Basically. Thank you, Ivo. So, in the interest of time, as we also like to run a quick Menti poll uh, for for the last five minutes, uh, can I invite you to you know maybe wrap up uh, with thirty seconds of your final words words of wisdom uh, to our <laughs> listeners in today. Um, no, again, just very grateful for, for everyone who's online. Um, I'm happy to share the presentation with Faroz and Juan. Um, and, and as I said, I mean, do, do, do try to, to use this, this pandemic not to go back to business as usual, but to try and find a way um, for your business uh, or organization to move towards a low carbon uh, resilient economy. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Ivo. Thank you so much. Uh, please join me for a virtual applause, you know, the new norm applause. Uh, but please stay with us for a while. Uh, we just want to run a quick mentee poll uh, with everyone here. Uh, so for this, I'm just going to hand it over to Juan uh, to walk us through the process. Juan, can you, uh, can you uh, walk everyone through? Uh, sure. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Juan. Um, so, I think I'm sharing the right screen, am I? Give me a sec. Share. We can see the Menti screen here. Okay. Yeah. Right. Uh, so if you log into menti.com, uh, all you need to do once you've logged into menti.com is to just input the code 345727. Uh, click on submit. Uh, and then you'll see this. I will be controlling the, um, uh, the poll from here. Yeah, so if, if, if we could just everybody to just log onto Menti, uh, key in the code which is in the chat box so we could uh, look at some polls, please. Yeah, sure. Okay, so let's, let's go to the poll, poll questions. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Okay, I hope everybody is uh, logged on. Uh, Please feel free to click whichever is the most appropriate answer for you guys. Uh, 
Mas Sony, ya. Let's give it a couple more seconds for people to log on. Okay, let's let's go. Uh, let's go to the next one. One. Next, next question one. One, can we go to the next question, please? Yeah, sure, just give me a second. So please do share your insights because this will help to shape our Malaysianized programs uh, on climate as well. I think even in the future, we need to play some background music during this time. It's just like eerily quiet. <laughs> no, but it's, it's, I, I like these questions because it's, it's sort of, I think it gives insight for everyone who's online to sort of see yeah. what, what others uh, think. But yeah, we need some music. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, next question, uh, one. Okay, next. Oh, this is this is very heartening. <laughs> this would, would uh, uh, cause a lot of uh, movement towards more uh, positive climate actions. There's many countries who already have a. Um... A, a carbon tax. I think one um, report, uh, Faroz, I would recommend is uh, there's a report on the state of carbon uh, pricing. So not the state of carbon market, but the state of carbon pricing by the World Bank. And they've right. listed every country in the world that has a carbon tax and also okay. listed how, how high that carbon tax is. And you see that some carbon taxes are $6 per ton, but some are $130 per ton. Wow. So it really Such depends on the countries on what kind of carbon tax you're setting. But uh, right. there's many many countries already across the world that have set a carbon tax. Interesting. And, uh, next question, uh, one. I think we have just two more, two more questions to go and then uh, we're done. So this is a rank question. I think you can choose the, top, the, uh, the most important in, in, in that sequence.
Oh. <laughs> oh, that's nice. Everybody's advocating a carrot and stick approach. Okay, I think let's let's go to the final question. Is it the final question, right? One next. Okay, I think with that, uh, we have come to the end of our, our poll. And thank you, everybody, for your insights. Um, uh, we will definitely uh, share the slides uh, to to people who have participated for today, uh, and we continue to uh, we hope to be continuously engaging with each other because together only we can push the climate agenda in uh, Malaysia. Uh, before we lock off, uh, whoever that is still patiently with us, if I could ask you to also come on camera so we can do a group photo. Uh, and then we can send this to Evo. <laughs> right, if I can ask everyone to come on, come on camera to have a group photo. I think one so needs one, to, to sort of stop the yeah. uh, the sharing and then... Uh... Yeah, so, so one uh, on your queue. Uh. Yeah, let's give it a few, let's give it a couple more seconds. Sure. So it looks like I'm the only one who, who wishes he's on a tropical island, you know. <laughs> okay, all right. Uh, on my cue, uh, on three, smile. So one, two, three, cheese. All right. Okay. Thank, thank you, everyone, for your time today. Please keep in touch. Uh, we'll keep you updated for our future events and see you soon. Again, Ivo, thank you so much. Keep in touch. Take care. You're welcome. Okay, Good thank luck, you, everyone. Ivo. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Hello, Mr. Rizal. Apa kabar? Lama tak jumpa. Hey, How are you, How are you, man? Ah, yo, bit busy lah. <laughs> <laughs> are we the only ones left behind now? The others? Oh no, the others. Hey, sorry? No, no. I, I think there were seven. No, are there? There are others. I thought we were the only ones left behind. Oh, I think one by one they're dropping off lah. <laughs> How? How? So you see, everybody agrees to your carbon tax, so we should do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we, we yeah, we, we've been talking about this and see, you know, we, this is need, something needed. There's no no two ways about it. You can't avoid it, right? Or at least some pricing, exactly. some element of pricing. Yeah, yeah. So, but do you foresee the coming budget will announce something like this? Uh, I haven't had any engagements with uh, the those guys, EPU and MYF, so I I don't think they're thinking about these things yet. I don't yes, know. I, because at the moment, uh, I don't know. Uh, who was telling me? That I I was somebody was telling me. That uh, apparently uh, Mewa Mewa has said that look out for the upcoming budget. There are things that's going to be con connected to climate action, lah. But they didn't say what. All I right. don't know. Let's see. <laughs> Could be another another grant to invest in green energy again. Who knows? <laughs> same old, same old, lah. <laughs> same old, same old. You, you can you can do you you know you can do that, but at the same time you need. Uh, some mechanism, right, to tax pollution, all that. I mean, you, you know. That. You know, I, I didn't realize that UNEP actually is doing so many uh, implementation things on the ground. No? I thought this kind of things we can just take and and, and implement yeah. as well, you know. Yeah. So it's a waste, lah, you know. You can roll it out here or maybe adapt it a bit. Yeah, absolutely. Are, are you are you uh, involved with the JC3? What are they? What, how's things over oh. there? No, I don't hear much other than some blurbs here and there. 
That's all. Yeah, I think they've been busy with uh, you know like the economic issues and SME financing. Yeah, Panjana Prihatin, all that. Uh. And whether they're still, whether they're still, whether they're still the in, slide, yeah, whether they're still in government in the next coming months or so, lah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You government, old government, but I know those guys are there, right? So they they should move on. They should push it. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, should do it. They should just push it. Yeah. And get those dialogues with MOF. I, I just met Deputy MOF yesterday. Uh. Uh, no, no, yesterday, two days ago. Yeah. So I think that you know, they they want to you know, they want to discover new things. Uh, you know, you know, try out uh, some of these things. But uh, it's a more a lot of capacity building required, lah. They need to be educated, aware, you know. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Correct. So they, uh, this time around, unfortunately, you know, COVID nineteen and Parliament, because Parliament starting next week, so he was, yeah. you know, he was just talking about the Parliament session upcoming. Yeah. And, and uh, so, but unfortunately, you know, most of us can't go there. And I, I don't know. You remember? I think I remember you telling me that you had a program coming up there. Yeah, but everything postponed lah because of this. Yeah, now. yeah. Every uh, happened. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sorry, May postponed, and then of course, yeah. uh, and this one put out very, very limited access, even you yeah. know, this yeah. this upcoming Parliament. So, so you know, whatever program from outsiders, you know. Can 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 happen at the moment, yeah. Yeah, that's the that's, uh, that's the thing, lah. Uh, yeah, yeah. But uh, Zafro should get this. I mean, Zafro should drive this. The the finance minister. Yeah, but I heard he's too busy with his political ambitions. Uh, well, yeah. And, uh, rumor has it he's going he's going to run, huh? Well, yeah. I think it's not enough just to be a a, a senator. So <laughs> I think you want to have a right some grassroots, lah. Uh. I also heard. I also I'm not heard. talking to the campaign manager. Uh, oh, is it? Oh, oh okay. I, 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 that'd be good, lah. You know? <laughs> I, I know. But, so but you're right. Lah. I mean, look, coming from CIMB, I, he would at least have the DNA for this kind of things, right? So, mm. let's see, lah. Tapi, I mean, between this this Zoom call, CIMB pun jerit je kuat, lah. Buat the the in terms of deployment still. <laughs> And you know, the rest of them are not really moving. Ben Monan and all those, all yeah. those guys. Yes, uh? 